magnificent and uh, generous introduction. Um, I also want to thank uh, Mr. Gormley for a, a rather exquisite, thoughtful and uh, generous consideration of, of what Pride is about and, and more pertinently the uh, Green Party's uh, consistent support of Pride. Uh, there's, uh, and I, indeed I want to thank you all for inviting me to be a part of this important event. There's, there's a strange symmetry to me being here because um, exactly 25 years ago, on my way to the first, to Dublin, indeed Ireland's first ever um, Gay Pride March, which tellingly it was called then, uh, on my way to the first ever um, Gay Pride March in 1983, I actually stopped by here to deliver a letter to uh, the Lord Mayor. Um, it was a rather dubious honour in hindsight because um, I, it, well, I was essentially with, with, the, sort of, with the arrogance um, of, of the arrogance and presumption of youth, I was uh, asking him to declare um, the participation and the active participation of Dublin City Council in the events that was just about to unfold to Dublin City's amazement. <laughs> Where 200 people wandered from Bradford Street down to the GPO and rededicated the GPO as the gay person's organisation. <laughs> There was also, in delivering that letter, there was a, again, with the presumption and arrogance that goes with being 23 and being caught up with, with the extraordinary vitality and energy of the, the what I call the nascent uh, lesbian gay civil rights movement at the time. There was a gentle a demand in that letter for the recognition, as I said, the recognition and participation of the City Council in what was a very significant and determined um, decision by us, the LGBT communities, to assert our visibility and more importantly uh, to uh, begin to share our rather transgressive yet exciting um, um, and colourful lifestyles and traditions with this beautiful city. And it's, we've come such a different uh, distance that it's, it's easy to take for granted uh, just how extraordinarily brave and fearful that that, that that determination was, the fact that 200 people were prepared to brave um, a lot of social opprobrium, possibly actually have to get, end up with some uh, vindictiveness from their family or be uh, forced out at work or whatever, to actually come out on the streets and to assert that level of visibility. And that first gay pride protest march, again, how telling the description, that first gay pride protest march, um, came on the back of a rather extraordinary and sadly grim period in, in our history when, um, uh, well, I mean, the, the, the 80s were economically grim for all of us, but uh, even if they were a, a tad culturally cre creative. But it was an incredibly, for us, it was incredibly grim because um, gay men were being murdered all over the place, so people were being bashed um, with impunity, and there were no legal safeguards. We hadn't actually arrived at the point where there was the raft of um, anti-discrimination legislation and equality legislation that we now um, and rightly take for granted. Um, and I've written about this in the program actually, so I, I, I'd like you all to take the time to actually um, read it in fact from cover to cover. <laughs> um, but in a way, what we were doing at that first march, the march and in subsequent marches was we were, we were simply looking for a very ordinary sense of recognition and acceptance in a culture that was officially and unofficially steeped in homophobia. In fact, I venture to say the, the term homophobia hadn't even gained current common currency in Irish society, but and possibly even hadn't gained current, common currency amongst us. But there was that demand for a very simple and rightful recognition, um, which was ignored uh, blithely uh, and rather shamefully by the broadcast and print media which I think is quite extraordinary. I mean, you've got 200 uh, Ferguson Dykes walking down James Street uh, making a lot of noise and you'd wonder why it doesn't merit even um, you know, a one-inch column in the Evening Herald or the Evening Press. It's quite extraordinary. Um, and there was that simple and micro recognition fraught in a society that was only beginning to find a legal and generous accommodation through the equality, equality legislation and anti-discrimination that I mentioned. And it's extraordinary when we just take a moment to pause on, on, on that period to just simply see the distance we've travelled. And of course that's what Pride is about, right? to actually acknowledge the distance we've travelled and to give thanks 
for where we are now. And I suppose, without sounding ungracious, to never take it for granted. Um, we can take so much for granted, both as a queer community and also, I, I venture, the, the city administration can take this for granted. And I think, you know, if you consider that we're all social beings, I'm sure that's the main reason why we live and gravitate towards a large city like Dublin, with Dublin with one and a half million citizens. Um, we're social beings with a need for defining our social identities. And we need to define our social identities on our own terms, without having to make excuses uh, to other people for it. And in doing that, um, we, we need to do it, we need to define our social identities without some sort of glib, patronizing, pseudo-acceptance or what passes for tolerance uh, from people. We need to actually shape our social identities uh, and define them. And in doing so, we have a responsibility, in a sense, we have a contract, I would, I would suggest, with Dublin City Council, with the citizens of Dublin. And we have a, a contract, and the contract involves a di an ongoing dialogue. It's a contract that actually suggests that, um, and in fact, I, I'd like to say now that I think in future years we will stop and think of Pride once a year as the point when we regularly reevaluate that contract with the City Council and with Dublin City. And how we do that is, well, firstly, we put it up to Dublin City Council and the, the largest civic administration in this country with an amazing tradition since the 1300s. We put it up to the City Council to take ownership of Pride. Um, and if we accept that the new cities of the 21st century are those that will give full expression to the, the buzzwords of diversity, multiculturalism, and interculturalism that John so eloquently talked about earlier on, if we accept that the new cities of the 21st century, like Dublin hopefully, will be those that will accept all this and give full and rightful expression to it, then it behoves of the City Council, well, first of all, it's how it's work for that, which I suggest, but it behoves of the City Council to totally embrace uh, pride. Um, and I'm not suggesting that what they've what they're done so far is, is just mere tokenism. Um, but I, think that I really do think that they have to go a little bit further. There's a responsibility there, first, because they can take leadership. They can take leadership with the corporate sector, and they can negotiate with the corporate sector on our behalf. And they can also, uh, with the honorable exception of the Labour Party and the Green Party, they can also show some leadership with um, um, some people who have cocooned themselves in the Euroctis and who are still tying and tearing themselves up in knots over the semantics of marriage or partnership rights or whatever. The last of the, what I call the last of the bits of the, the uh, civil rights uh, jigsaw. Um, so the City Council has a role to play and I would like to think that we will encourage it and that's the other part of the contract. I think we as an LGBT community, LGBT community, with all our confidence and our traditions, we have to actually remember that there is a responsibility and an onus on us to also um, constantly work that contract with Dublin City Council and to say it's now time to get out of our little bubble. It is time to get out of the ghetto. It is time now to, to take some active citizenship and to have a sort of generous spirit that we will share and accommodate with the rest of the systems of Dublin. And, uh, and I'd really like to think in that respect the Dublin Pride has arrived. I mean, I think we can all agree with that at this stage. Um, but, um, but, but I'd really like to say that, it, uh, accepting that it's arrived, you know, it's, it's remarkable that it's been for the slow learners, and I'd I, I like to think there's none in this room, there are none in this room. For the slow learners, it's been under our noses for a long, long time. An occasion when we got sloppy, it's been right in your face. Um, it is a of some of the broadcast uh, documentaries to actually uh, and, and show that. But anyway, um, I, but I want to declare now tonight in the wonderful company of our minister and our gorgeous bride, uh, Tabina, and with you all, ladies and gentlemen, I want to formally declare, with the participation of Dublin City Council, that this June, two things, this June, Dublin City Council has formally outsourced its fund management. And secondly, ladies and gentlemen, this June, Dublin City is going to have one hell of a party. Yeah. Um, yeah.